thanks to all of you for coming and thanks so much for inviting me. I am always, always happy to talk about my favorite thing and that's food. You know, when I was um, going to school, there wasn't really a way to study food. I tried, but I knew that I didn't want to be a chef and actually work in a restaurant. And I also knew that I didn't want to be a dietitian or take a course in um, anything that was really like agriculture. I wanted to talk about food and culture. And in those days, even if you were trying to study anthropology of food, it was really archeology span and not anthropology. And so there was really nothing to do. So I did what you do when you don't know what to do. I went to law school and I became a lawyer, but it really was a way for me to see the world. I was able to travel because I was a lawyer and um, I really was fortunate enough to eat in a lot of places. And one of the things I learned because I was eating in other places was that there was no place like Louisiana. And it took actually leaving Louisiana to know that because when you're a child and you're eating this wonderful food, you think this is what food is. This is the way it is everywhere. And then you find out it's not true. So I'm going to tell you a horrible story. I was in the army and I had to go to Fort Gordon, Georgia. And I was there because that's where the military police school is. And because I was a JAG officer, I had to spend a month at the military police school. And all of the JAG officers were invited to go to the Masters Club where the Masters Golf Tournament takes place. And I went and I was given a menu. And on the menu, it said one of the choices was trout almondine. Now, I love trout almondine. I thought, whoa, this is really great. I'm going to get trout almondine. So I ordered trout almondine. And what I got was fish sticks with chopped almonds on top. <laughs> and that's when I knew I wasn't in Louisiana anymore. So I finally decided that it would be time to open a food museum. I had had some experience working at the University of New Orleans uh, with museums that were being opened there. And so it was a lot of on-the-job training that I thought I could apply to a food museum in New Orleans. And one of the things that I learned was that there were lots and lots of uncovered and unsung people who had contributed to the food of the South in particular, the food of South Louisiana. And so today, I'm going to talk about some of the women who contributed to our wonderful cuisine. And so this is something that I think is very exciting because there's, there's so much to know and so much to learn. And I think we can kind of do some of that tonight. So first of all, I want to talk to you about the really early, early time. So of course, the French came here and a lot of what we know about what was here when the French were exploring are in the journals and letters and reports of the French people who were actually the explorers. What they did and what they talked about about themselves, these people were men, um, was that they were actually enslaving Native American women to cook for them. And unfortunately, we don't know who any of those women are. Their names are never recorded. And they would often run away. And it was pretty easy for them to run away because they knew the territory very well. And unfortunately, though, they would, the, these explorers would just go find somebody else. But they were being fed by women. So one of the things that we know is that these people who were exploring were French, and they were very different from the English people who we learn about when we learn about American history. So we know that when they talk about the early American part of the world, they're talking about the 13 colonies. So in England, 
There was England and there was the colonies. So this is the time of the Enlightenment. And there is a belief that there's England. And if you are English and you're here settling on behalf of England, you need to maintain your Englishness. This is really important. So many of the people who were in the early colonies died, not because there was no food. They died of starvation, not because there was no food. They died because they wouldn't eat like savages. So they were planting things, that, seeds that they had brought from England that didn't grow here. And of course, they hadn't thought about the geography being different, the latitude being different from what they were used to. And they wouldn't eat the food that was here because it wasn't English food. And they didn't want to lose their identity. So the French had a totally different attitude. The French were here, and they considered this not a colony, but an actual extension of France. And so if you were here and you had to eat an alligator, it was a French alligator. <laughs> and so it was easy for them to eat what was here because they didn't have this idea about it not being France. It was France to them. So everything that was here was French. Now, if you were a Native American, you may not have thought that, but Nevertheless, that was the attitude that they brought with them. And that was kind of the difference. They, of course, were part of the Enlightenment too, but that was the difference between the French and the English. And that, I believe, is one of the reasons why we have a cuisine and they don't. So once um, the colonists, they weren't really called not colonists, the new settlers who were brought here were being brought from prisons. So if you were a pickpocket or you were in debtor's prison, you would be being sent to this new colony, this new place, this new settlement. And when you were brought here, it was almost all men. So everybody has probably heard about the casket girls and all of that. Well, they finally started to bring women over. And you may also have heard the story of the um, the Petti Petticoat Rebellion. Are you familiar with that story? So the Petticoat Rebellion goes like this. And don't worry, I will actually start talking about some of these people in a minute. I'm just kind of laying some foundation here. So according to the Petticoat Re Rebellion, some of the casket girls and other women who came to this settlement were very frustrated when they got here because the food the, the raw materials were different from the food that they were used to. And of course there was no, for example, there was no wheat that would grow here. So there was no flour. There was only corn and cornmeal. And so that's just an example. There were things like alligators and bears that people were eating. Um, there were bison. There were all kinds of wonderful things. And just the bounty of the Gulf and the waters here alone was fabulous. We had pecans, my goodness, who would be sorry to have pecans? And there were mayhaws and pawpaws and all kinds of other things. There were the three sisters, which are corn, squash, and beans that grew together all over. There were many, many things that were really um, forming a fabulous basis for food here in this region. However, they, they didn't know that supposedly these women didn't know how to cook with these foods. So apparently they took their pots and wooden spoons and walked down the street to Bienville and said to him, you have to teach us how to cook. And he had a housekeeper and he set the housekeeper to talking to them um, about all of the food. And supposedly this was the very first cooking school in the States. Now, none of this makes any historical sense. The women that were supposed to be here 
were not ever sent at the same time that Bienville was in charge of the colony. I mean, there's just full of everything that doesn't make it work. But what it means to me is that it was necessary to have an origin story. And if it's necessary to have an origin story, it means that it's something very important to the people here. And I think that the people here identify with their food. So after the city of New Orleans was founded in 1718, it became necessary because you had all of these people who were coming out of debtor's prison who were almost all urban. They did not know how to farm. They did not know how to do anything that you might need to do in the kind of wilderness that was here. So that's when they started to bring enslaved people here. And these were people who were uh, being brought from Africa. So when they got here, um, the Catholic Church imposed something that was uh, uh, on the French called the Code Noir. And the Code Noir was first put into place in 1724. And it allowed that enslaved people had to have Sunday off. They all had to be baptized and they had Sunday off. And on that Sunday, they could do what they liked, which meant that they could sell goods, they could sell food, they could sell coffee. And the money that they sold these things for was theirs. And this was the beginning of the way that the Vendus, the Vendus began to accumulate enough money to buy their freedom. And so early in the 18th century, that was something that was already begun, and it was creating a class of people so that you had the enslaved people, you had free people of color, and you had the white people. And the people who were the native people were in and out, but only on the outside. They were never, they could come into town, they would perhaps buy things or trade with people in the French market, but they were not settled into the town. So those Vendus, they sold candy, they sold kala, they sold coffee, they sold all sorts of things on the streets um, with makeshift stands, sometimes with little carts that they pulled. Um, they carried their candy in large baskets. All of this seems like a very um, small and um, not very lucrative way to earn money, but they did. And they could buy whatever they wanted, but they could also save their money so that they could buy their freedom. So one of the people who did that was Rosette Rochon. So Rosette Rochon was born in Mobile, and she was a, a person who was a placé. So I don't know if you've heard of um, plassage, but plassage was the type of environment in which um, women would be kept by a man. And the woman was called the concubine. And the, the system, the actual regulated system was called plassage. And you might be in placé. Uh, another example, if you've ever read the story, Gigi, Gigi was placé, and um, she was uh, encouraged by her mother to be well-educated and attractive and knew how to make conversation, and her mother put her out to placage, and she had to find a man to take care of her. Um, Rosette Rochon, was a businesswoman. She was born into slavery, but she was freed. She came to New Orleans from Mobile through Haiti, and after the, uh, the rebellion in Haiti, to New Orleans. She died um, as a person who had am amassed what would today be millions of dollars worth of property, she lived in one of the houses that um, Bernard de Marigny uh, developed from his land, 
And so she was part of his friend group and, and friend circle. She was a butcher. She was the only woman in the butcher's uh, league. And she was in many ways um, a wonderful businesswoman. She also took advantage of the port and she became a ship's chandler. And she had grocery stores and did a lot of delivery. So she was a person who was not herself a cook, but who made it possible for other people to cook and use the fact that people in New Orleans, especially, were interested in food to be, uh, to use food as something that made her fortune. Another person who took advantage of this was Rose Nico. Rose Nico was born in 1812. Rosette Rochon was born in 1767. So she was very early. Rose Nico was born in 1812, and she um, was so famous that people all over the country knew who she was. She had a little wooden stand that she would use to sell coffee in the hall of vegetables. She was known for buying green coffee, roasting it in the market, and the smell of the roasting coffee would entice people to come in. Other people, because of her, would make their stands around her so that they sold things that complemented the coffee. And so they were selling kala, they were selling um, candy, they were selling bread and other things, and all of it would be something that after mass on a Sunday morning, people would walk across the street from the cathedral and they would have coffee and someone else would be selling them kala. And that was something that established her as a very, very famous person. She, um, today, there is actually a coffee shop in the French Quarter that is called Rose Nico. It honors her and it is something that you just can hardly believe that a person would buy, able to be able to buy their freedom because they sold coffee. She sold coffee that was uh, mostly what we call pure coffee, not uh, coffee and chicory, but she would have chicory there for those people who had developed a taste for it. Her coffee was mostly black with sugar and um, Everyone said that if you drank her coffee, that you would never be able to drink anybody else's. She was very well known, and it was something that um, you, really, you really can't even imagine, because imagine selling coffee for two and three cents a cup, and from that, you save enough money to buy your freedom. That's really quite remarkable, and talks a lot about the, the will of certain people. So let's move on to Nellie Murray. Now, Nellie Murray wasn't born until 1835, so we were already a state by the time she was born. She was born enslaved, but she uh, bought her freedom, and she became a world-famous caterer. She was famous because of the World's Fair in 1883, 1884. She was a person who, during that time, uh, was feeding people during the fair, and because of that, they learned who she was. And I think it's just amazing. She lived in Rome and Bucharest she lived in London and Paris. She lived in all of those places, was written up in the newspaper all the time. She was such a famous caterer and her food was considered to be so good. We don't know her anymore, but she was a really, really important contributor to this long line of people who have been molding our food and we just aren't aware. So, 
After Nellie Murray, we have Lena Richard. Lena Richard was born in 1892. Now, Lena Richard has a lot to offer. And of course, she is represented in the exhibit that we have here now. Lena Richard was, I consider her the Martha Stewart of her day. And everyone also knew her through newspapers all over the country. She would travel from place to place and she would actually cook um, and have, it was, it was something to be able to say, I hired Lena Richard to come and cater my party in Chicago or cater my party in Houston or whatever. So she was that famous. She was so famous that the Rockefellers, the Rockefeller Foundation hired her to establish the restaurant in what was then the beginnings of Colonial Williamsburg. So the Rockefellers um, really funded Colonial Williamsburg and they wanted to find somebody who was famous because they wanted to give a shot in the arm to their restaurant there. And so they picked her to, to hire. Now, I will tell you, if you look at any of the, um, any of the cookbooks that came out of Colonial Williamsburg, they do reference Lena Richard, but they say, Lena Richard, our esteemed cook, they don't ever really recognize what she did, which is a shame because not only was she that recognized that the Rockefellers brought her from New Orleans to Williamsburg to establish the restaurant, put its menu together, create the recipes for the restaurant, all of that. But she also started a cooking school she also created a cookbook that she published herself. And she also was the first African-American to have a television show named after them. Now that television show started in 1949 in New Orleans at WDSU. WDSU was one of the first um, television stations in the United States. It wasn't the first, but it was one of the, like, the top 15. And so because of that, they were always looking for programming. And this was at a time, and those of you who are, are sort of younger probably don't ever think about television not being something permanent, but television used to be like radio. It was live. It went out over the airwaves and it was over. And so there was no saving a program. It wasn't until 1951 that something called this kinescope was invented. And what that was, was a way to keep television shows. And what they would do is turn the television on and put a film camera in front of the television and actually film the TV show. Now, if you've ever seen really old TV shows from the 50s and you know how weird they look, it's because the only way they could be saved was if you filmed them. They were on a screen that was curved, so it makes a kind of distortion anyway. And the TV show would be on and then right here would be the, the, um, the camera and it was literally filmed. And so what you're looking at is old film. So anything that you see at that time, that's why it looks so bizarre. It was invented, the idea of it was invented in 1951 and Lena Richard died in 1950. So we have no kinescopes of her. And in this sort of media savvy world we live in today, it's almost as though you didn't exist if you weren't captured, even if you were on television. But if you look at old times Picayune uh, TV sections, there used to be a whole section in the paper that was all about what's on television. And she was featured 
every day that she was going to be on, there were still photos of her because her show was that popular. The reason I say that she was like Martha Stewart is that she named her, her book after her TV show so that she was always cross-promoting what she was doing. She was very, very smart. And Houghton Mifflin, the publishing company, learned of her TV show, I mean, and they learned of her, her cookbook, and they reprinted it. Now, they changed the name. They took her name off of it, and instead of being the Lena Richard cookbook, it became a New Orleans cookbook. Um, and I think that, that it's really unclear whether they did that to erase her from the cookbook or whether they simply thought it would sell more uh, cookbooks because it said New Orleans on it. We don't really know the answer to that, but it is really a shame that she did not have her name on the cookbook. She was, it was named as the author, but it wasn't part of the name of the cookbook. Anyway, she was very famous. If you, if you try any of her recipes, things like stuffed shrimp and her jambalaya and her um, fried, uh, fried catfish, fr fried um, redfish, all of those things, those things were so delicious. And at, at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, we, um, we are always picking something out of her, her cookbook to decide we're going we're gonna to taste this. And with the simplest number of recipes and ingredients, she was able to coax unbelievable flavor. And it's really amazing. In one of her stuffed shrimp recipes, she actually grates the onion, puts the grated onion into cheesecloth, and squeezes out the onion juice so that you don't ever get a piece of onion because she didn't want to have onion in the stuffed shrimp because the shrimp's head is so small that she didn't want to take up room with the onion, but she wanted you to have the flavor of the onion. That's the kind of detail that we're talking about. And she really, really just died, unfortunately, so that we don't have her left and she um, was not replaced by her, her daughter who used to go on television with her. She wasn't replaced by her daughter. She was replaced by someone else. But she was really well known and she was important because people watched her and they learned to cook from her in a way that we talk about Julia Child. That is the way people used to talk about Lena Richard. But we don't, of course, remember any of that. And almost anybody who would be old enough and rich enough to have a television in 1950 when she died isn't with us anymore. So we can't ask them what they thought. And then finally, I want to talk about Leah Chase. Now, Leah Chase is important for just innumerable reasons. Um, first of all, she is the only person in this list that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. So um, that also kind of colors the way I look at it. But she was born in 1923 and she died not long ago in 2019. She was born on January 6th, which is the first day of Mardi Gras. And I always thought that that was a, a wonderful day to be born especially if you're from New Orleans. Um, she actually wasn't from New Orleans. She was from Madisonville, but she adopted New Orleans. So she came to New Orleans and she began to work in the kitchens in the French Quarter at the white tablecloth restaurants there. Now by this time, Jim Crow is firmly established in Louisiana and all of the restaurants there were white, restaurants, white only restaurants. She decided that it would be really wonderful to have a white tablecloth restaurants for black people. And so she talked to her mother-in-law, Mrs. Chase, 
who was Dookie Chase Sr.'s wife, and they had a bar that was called Dookie Chase. And at that bar, you could get, you know, anything to drink, but also there was bar food, like red beans and rice, or a, a bowl of gumbo, maybe a po' boy. And you could go there and actually have a, a little tub of something that would allow you to take, say, gumbo away. Now, there was no official takeout. You certainly couldn't get a takeout container, but if you brought your own container, they would fill it for you and then charge you appropriately. So she said to her mother-in-law, I really want to, to change this restaurant. I want to turn it into a restaurant and not have it be a bar. And her mother-in-law, to her credit, said, okay, let's give it a try. So in the beginning, it was not successful. And the reason it wasn't successful is because she was cooking the food that she was cooking in the French Quarter, and the people that were her audience, or her potential audience, were not familiar with that food. So they began to sneak back in things like white beans and shrimp, and a really you know, elevated gumbo with good cornbread, and people started to come, but they were eating it on a white tablecloth. This food was being elevated, and then, because she was feeding the police and making everybody feel happy, when white people started to go because they heard how good the food was, which was totally against the law, the police turned and just didn't see it. And so she also was kind, so that those people who were, because her husband, Dougie Chase Jr., was a musician. When people who were musicians didn't have money, she would feed them and they would play in the restaurant. Or if people were artists and they didn't have money, they could give her a painting and she would feed them. So now in Dookie Chase, you see one of the finest collection of Southern African American art that there is. Also, she allowed the restaurant to be used to plan much of the civil rights movement that came out of New Orleans. Now, one of the benefits was that the restaurant was large enough to have a really big meeting. If you were in some parts of the South and you were trying to plan and put together logistics of various kinds of um, meetings, uh, protests, or uh, sit-ins or whatever was being planned, it was really hard because you had to do it in somebody's house and there was limited seating. But you could find regularly people like Thurgood Marshall, um, Israel Augustine, um, other, other very famous, Martin Luther King, famous people in the civil rights movement eating gumbo and she used to say, that if you can't solve the world's problems over a bowl of gumbo, then there's no, no hope for this world. Anyway, she was writing cookbooks. She was on television. She was doing all sorts of things that really made her an ambassador to the, to the whole country for New Orleans. And when she was on television, she was doing it not just in New Orleans, but she was being broadcast in other places. And so that meant people were learning about the food here. She was so famous that many, many presidents went to Dookie Chase to eat. And there's a wonderful story and a picture also to prove it, that um, when President Obama went there to have dinner or some meal, he picked up the hot sauce and was about to put it on his gumbo, and she pushed his hand away and she said, you can't put any hot sauce on this until you taste it first because I think it's just right. <laughs> so all of this to say, these are, these are just a few women that I've talked about 
following in the footsteps of the food that was created by the Native American women. If, if you can't figure out how the food of Lo Southern Louisiana is really based on African influences, all of these women, all of them were African American, and all of them played, played a very important role in creating the food of not only New Orleans, but of the uh, southern part of Louisiana. So we can bring this into the future and say that we continue to have many um, immigrants coming to, to live here, and they all bring their own food. Um, I really didn't talk about the Sicilians, which is the uh, basis of my book that I have here tonight. Um, oh, almost 100,000 Sicilians came here between 1885 and 1915. In that 30 year period, almost 100,000 came here and they changed the food of the city. And when the Vietnamese came here after the fall of Saigon, they changed the food. There are so many people changing the food of our home. And one of the things that I am the most proud of is that we don't do what other places do. For example, New Orleans, not New Orleans, New York is one of the best food cities in the, in the country. You can, you can eat the world in New York. You can find the most obscure kind of food there. Um, and it's, it's good, it's great. But here in South Louisiana, we don't do that. We don't keep all these little, these little restaurants from different countries or different parts of countries. Our food becomes an amalgam. And if I go to your house and you serve me gumbo, I know it's gumbo. I may not think it's like my gumbo, but it's gumbo. And if you come to my house, you know what I'm serving you is gumbo even though it's different from yours. And to me, that's what connects all of us, is that we can recognize other people's gumbo. And we know that we're all from South Louisiana. So thank you very much. And I'm opening it up to questions. <laughs> Anybody? Yes? Mm -hmm. So I have a comment and a question. Okay. Um, one of my comments is that I have been to a, an event, a party, where recipes from your most recent cookbook were all prepared, and it was amazing. I mean, it was just <laughs> epicurean delight. I also um, shared that cookbook with my father, who is of Sicilian descent. Thank you. And um, so when he had his own copy, he was really emotionally transported. Um, by the stories and recipes. And I wonder if you can speak to the immigrant experience in relation to um, your museum and the work that your museum, which people here tonight may not know is associated with the Nunez Library. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm with the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, which is a museum that opened in 2008 in New Orleans that is all about the food of the South. And um, one of the things that is really important to us is that we represent all of the people who contribute to our food as it, as it changes. And one of the important things that I have learned, especially in talking about my, my own cookbook, I grew up in the Sicilian community in New Orleans. So I would go to parties where everyone spoke Sicilian and people um, were playing mandolins and concertinas and singing all kinds of Sicilian folk songs and things. And every year, whenever you'd, you'd see that the number of people who were still doing that was dwindling because they were dying off. And I saw that my own children didn't know anybody who was from that group. They knew me, they knew my mother, but my mother was not an immigrant. She was born here in the United States, in New Orleans. 
So as much as she grew up in that community and spoke Sicilian, um, she was still an American. And I could not find any first person accounts of growing up in this community. You could read a lot of things that historians had written about it, but not people telling you, well, this is what I experienced and this is what it was like. And so that's really why I wrote the book because I felt that that was what we, somebody needed to write a first person account. And so I wrote it for my children and my grandchildren. Um, but when I've talked about it in all kinds of places, telling these stories and what people experienced when they were here, I've been really touched by the fact that even people from other, um, other immigrant countries um, see the similarities in the immigrant experience. And we can see how um, the food of New Orleans is important because if we're not here, um, we're, we're noticing that we don't have the food that we might want. Um, I, I, can, I can tell you that we had an, um, a website that we founded because we wanted to uh, have a presence as the Southern Food and Beverage Museum even before we had a location. And then Hurricane Katrina came in 2005 and people were spread all over. I mean, there was a serious diaspora and people were all over the country. And people would write to us at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum and at the, through the website and say, I can't find this, what am I gonna do? And, you know, I can't find filet. I can't find camellia beans. I can't find coffee and chicory. I can't find this laundry list of things that made up their daily or at least weekly food. And they felt not only displaced because they were physically not at home, but they were displaced because they didn't have their familiar food. And you see that with the immigrants who come to visit, not to visit, to move here, their food is not here and they miss that. They miss their food. And yet they begin to influence our food. And that is to me, one of the most wonderful things about the food of New Orleans. As I say, unlike a place like New York where everybody's food remains separate, we start to eat the food of all the people who are here. Now, it's different, everybody's food is a little bit different, but you see that their influences. I'm gonna give you a Sicilian influence that I bet you don't know is the Sicilian influence. We stuff our vegetables, stuff peppers, stuff eggplant with breadcrumbs. Now we might put crab meat in it and crawfish and other good stuff too, but the basis of it is, 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 um, is breadcrumbs. But in Mississippi and Alabama and South Carolina, all of those Southern states, they stuff their vegetables with rice. And if you ever bought Stouffer's stuffed bell peppers, they sell it frozen. That is made with rice because that is the Southern way. But here in Louisiana, in South Louisiana, we use, we use breadcrumbs and that's because of the Sicilians. And we don't even know it. It's become so absorbed by us that it's just natural. Um, so Miss Christine Anderson from Minnesota asks. Um, <laughs> I've been talking about Minnesota. <laughs> How would you recommend that a lay person who also happens to be a lawyer, having gone to law school for a similar reason, for a similar reason, go about learning, um, learning about local food history and also preserving local food history in the best way for future family generations by something beyond just handing down recipes? Well, I do think handing down recipes is an important thing. Um, but I will tell you that all kinds of skills that you learned from being a lawyer, like your ability to research, your ability to reason and understand good argument versus bad argument, 
All of those things allow you to do research into history and write it and interpret it in ways that can be written down as articles, if not in a cookbook. I mean, one of the things that a cookbook allows you to do is preserve the recipes, but in addition, tell the stories and um, uh, leave, uh, leave something for children and grandchildren at the same time. Um, if, if somebody is trying to make a career shift um, into, into food from law, I think uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is to write about food law in the beginning and then segue from there into just the food. And it, it, there's a lot of niche area in food law because most people in food don't know about the law. And so that would be something to think about. If, if I may ask a question, mm -hmm. I have the mic, so I'll just take it. <laughs> so I took so many notes while you were talking. I think you and I actually have some spirit animal that is inside of us that we don't know about because as we talked about before um, the conversation, uh, I'm a lawyer and I love food <laughs> and I love to cook. Uh, I've not written a cookbook nor will I ever, but I do love to cook. So um, like many of the people who you talked about tonight, um, I was well-traveled. My uh, husband was in the military and so I lived in Italy and uh, spent time all over the world really and spent a lot of time investigating food in other countries and like you decided Louisiana was the best um, and so uh, a lot of it was you know hamburger steak and rice and gravy and uh, you know corn and shrimp soup and um, just regular gumbo or fried catfish and we always bought our catfish from Tony's because you know it, just those kinds of things that ingrain you and being from South Louisiana um, also you spoke about um, the industry of cooking shows and this idea that journalism plays a part in upbringing of prominence of certain individuals and here at the archives, we have a lot of audiovisual archives as it relates to those kinds of things. And so we appreciate that as well. You touched on so many things in addition to hot sauce on food, which is an insult. <laughs> <laughs> and to, I, I love the spiciest food on the planet, but I don't ever put the hot sauce until I've tasted it. So. From a personal perspective, I just wanted to say that I just felt like it was so wonderful to hear your perspective on so many things that touched me personally, but as a Louisianian, an attorney, a food lover, a connoisseur, uh, and I just thank you so much. I know that we have other questions, and so I want to pass it off, but before that missed its opportunity, I just wanted to say thank you because I, I literally could I wanted to I wanted to do a standing ovation during multiple times during <laughs> your talk because I felt like you were speaking only to me so thank you thank you so much thank you I'll turn off the microphone and wait for a question <laughs> yes hello hi hey good evening that was great I really enjoyed it thank you for your time I have two questions so one kind of goes back. What is kalas? Kala? Kala. So kala is a rice fritter. So originally, and this will give you the arc of modernity. So originally it was uh, made with leftover rice and you would put it into a batter and leave it on a table overnight, uncovered, so that the yeasts in the air would fall into it and then kind of ferment it a little bit. And then in the morning, you would take that fermented batter and you would fry up the fritters and then dust them with uh, powdered sugar and eat them for breakfast. So it was a way to eat and use leftover rice. Then people started to actually sell yeast and you could actually buy yeast and inoculate it yourself. And then when you did that, you had 
a more reliable rise because you had used um, a, a yeast that was reliable. And then eventually they would use, instead of yeast, baking powder because you could make it right away. You didn't have to plan it for overnight. And, um, and so that's the way most people make it today um, if they make kala. Okay, so that kind of goes into my second question. So obviously things being shelf stable is like leading into modernity, right? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about where food is going in Louisiana considering the things that are, you know, of the time right now? So I don't know how many people are about to grow, but climate change, um, and different conversations about just poverty and education and the way things are happening, obviously, our history comes from people who are in vulnerable groups, right? And had to use creativity. Mm -hmm. But the economy and society is a little different now, obviously. So do you have any thoughts about where Louisiana cuisine is going now? Well, I, I think that as people continue to move to Louisiana, that our our cuisine is going to continue to change and be changed by the people who come here. But I think that there is a worry that the way of life, especially along the coast, um, is going to be lost because we're losing the coast. And um, I, I think climate change is part of it, but I think there are other issues involved in it too. Um, but, you know, we have uh, some native tribes that are having to be relocated now. And part of their, their lives is the fishing that they do. And if you can't fish anymore, how do you, you know, continue to have your culture? So it's a really difficult question. I don't know that I could stand here right now and give you, like, this is the answer. Um, but I do, I, I do believe that there's a lot of of stuff to talk about, for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Can you give us a bit of information about the origin of bread pudding, especially South Louisiana version of bread puddings? So bread pudding definitely is a European invention um, because there was no bread here that if we're talking about something made with yeast, I mean, uh, made with flour. Um, in the very, very earliest days, maybe in New England, they were able to grow some um, wheat and therefore they could make bread. But it was, um, it was something that if you read any of the early writings by the explorers and such, they bemoan the fact that there's no bread, that they can't eat bread, that you know, they have to eat some kind of corn pone or some kind of corn related substitute and they're never satisfied with it. So when they finally were sending flour to Louisiana, um, when it got here, one of the reasons that our bread is so fluffy, even though we call it French bread, it's not anything like the bread of France, um, is because we lost so much of it to mold and weevils and whatever as it was being shipped over. And so, the dough that was developed was very, very wet because you were trying to stretch it. And so that's why our bread pudding is the way, I mean, our bread is the way it is. And then of course it makes our bread pudding less dense than other places. I don't know if you've ever looked at some of the um, Mississippi and Alabama recipes for bread pudding where they use things like hamburger buns and, uh, other kinds of really dense, um, really dense um, bread, and their bread pudding is very heavy. Whereas ours is light and fluffy because we put lots of eggs and cream in it, and um, uh, it does eventually kind of settle down if you let it stay for a couple of days, and then you can easily cut it with a, a knife. But in the very beginning, that first serving of it is usually kind of fluffy. And uh, so, but the reason our bread is the way it is is because it, it took so long for the flour to get here that it was never in good shape. And so you think you have five pounds of flour, but you really only have three that it's edible. 
Thank you very much.